gradient of the expectation. So you want to take the gradient of this function and you get some unbiased approximation of that. Usually the way you, you get that is you either take the gradient of a randomly sampled example uh, or you take a mini batch chosen uniformly uh, at random and that gives you an unbiased or, or the average gradient on a mini batch gives you that approximation. So these are Francis's pictures. Uh, so gradient descent, you start at some point. These are the level curves of some function. The minimum is here. And I've shown you're always moving at sort of uh, these right angles to the to the level curves. And each time you move inside the level curves, and if you set your, set your step sizes right, you make slow progress towards the solution. And then this is Francis's drawing of stochastic gradient descent. So you start out with, uh, or, or you may have directions that are not orthogonal anymore. You may even have directions that go uphill and you start out taking very big step sizes, but you slowly make the step sizes smaller and you slowly get towards the optimum. Uh, and I always say that this, this plot here is maybe very generous to stochastic gradient descent. It, it is not really this fast at all. It, it's actually a very slow method. So the big advantage of SGD is in terms of the number of examples, the iteration cost is O of one. So if you have 1 billion examples, the iterations are 1 billion times faster than gradient descent. Another big advantage is that empirically, we see that it often works well for training deep neural networks. The disadvantages are really due to the variance in the gradient approximation. The fact that you're not always going in necessarily a good direction. And so what that means is you may need a huge number of iterations to get close to the solution. You may be very sensitive to the exact choice of the step size. And because you're, you're only viewing sort of a, a sample of the gradient, it's not obvious to know when to stop. You can't really test if these stochastic gradients are near zero, because even at the solution, they may not be zero. Um, OK, so a lot of the classic work on this, on sort of analyzing how fast SGD goes, focuses on convex functions. Convex functions are a very nice class, where all the, the stationary points, or all the local optima, are global optima. And so when we first started working on this problem, we, we focused on convex objectives. Why did we do that? Well, it's easier to prove things for convex objectives. We didn't really have very good proofs for non-convex objectives at that point in time. Uh, there's, there, there's, there's also this reasoning that if it doesn't work for convex functions, it won't work for non-convex functions. And that comes because in near minimizer, any non-convex function will still look like a convex function. And so if it doesn't work for convex functions, it shouldn't work near a minimizer. So for example, even deep learning objectives are going to be convex near the solutions, near the minimizers. Uh, and at that point in time, this was many years ago, we didn't really have great ways to analyze SGD for non-convex functions. We, it wasn't as common as it is now. now. OK. Um, so before I get in, uh, actually, let me mention one more thing before I, before I stop for potential discussion. So you, we, you can ask this question, how many iterations of SGD do we need to minimize a convex function? Many of us know the answer to this question now, but back in 2006, 2007, it was very hard to actually answer this question because the literature was very spread out and we didn't have the nice notation and assumptions and stuff we do now. But it, it was known back then that, that basically since the 1950s, that if you assume a function in, in modern notation is, is strongly smooth or because we have lots of optimizers, uh, the gradient is Lipschitz continuous. Uh, and if you're strongly convex, uh, and the variance of the gradient estimates is bounded, so you need the variance to be under control, it can't be arbitrarily bad, then if you want to reach an accuracy of epsilon, SGD, SGD needs one over epsilon iterations. And so this was really known in the 50s in like the stats literature, but it was really highlighted in the mid 2000s by Pegasus and work by Tong Zhang uh, and others. So that's in contrast to deterministic gradient descent. So if we have the exact gradient on each iteration, we only need log of one over epsilon iterations under the same assumptions. And if we're thinking of this from a computer science perspective, this I would really call exponential, and then this I would really call polynomial. And so we shouldn't really be happy with the one over epsilon rate. We should try and get log of one over epsilon if we want to have a polynomial time algorithm. Unfortunately, there's some negative results. Basically saying that if you have these assumptions and then your g of xk is an unbiased gradient, you actually can't go faster than one over epsilon. And that's true even in one dimension. So if you have those assumptions and you just have one variable you want to optimize, you actually can't beat one over epsilon. And that becomes because that's basically the speed limit for a Monte Carlo sampler. 
You might think you could do better by designing some sort of stochastic Newton or doing Nesterov acceleration or something like that. Uh, but in fact, those only improve the dependence on the condition number. They don't improve the, the dependence on the variance. And so those don't let you go faster than one over epsilon. So these things we normally think of of speeding up gradient descent, they won't work to speed up stochastic gradient descent, at least under this measure of performance. Okay, so I'm going to pause there and just, just uh, let it sit silent for a moment to see if anyone wants to bring up any discussion before I, before I move on to contributions. That's just a bit of background and setup. Hi, Mark. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's from the last slide, so you don't have to go back, but it's just for the non-convex setting. Is it the case that there are some pathological examples where you have a minimum where it's not convex in the neighborhood? Because uh, you're saying close to the, to the minimum, local minimum, normally you would be convex, which I think for most well behave, it's probably the case, but I'm not sure. It's, there's probably other cases where it's not, right? Yeah, not not really a question for me. So so, um, so we'll, let, let's try and think of what the counterexample would be there. So you, you would have to have something that it is a local minima in every direction, but then it's it's not. I, I I'm not yeah. sure. If, I'm not sure if there's a counterexample. Does someone else on the call know the answer to that question? I mean, if it's just local minimum, I guess using higher order derivatives, like the first two derivatives are zero at that point, but the higher order ones are not zero. No, you'd still be convex. So I think you might be star convex or something like that, but not convex, like, like any direction, because all the directional derivative being positive, does that mean that weird stuff cannot happen around it, right? But anyway. Yeah, so, so I think... Um, well, the Hessian is positive semi-definite. It's not definite, so bad things can happen. Yeah, so I think you would need a case where you have zero eigenvalues, and then something weird happens in the higher derivatives. But it's not, not something I've particularly thought about. Maybe a, a question that has a less theoretical answer, which is, um, I used to believe which is what this slide implies, that the issue was the noise of the gradient. And I'm actually wondering in real problems is if this is really what matters or if in general we stop optimization before reaching the noise ball, in which case actually accelerated methods do help. Um, do you have any intuition yeah. is that in practice, where do we stop? I'll actually come back to that issue, but that, that's sort of related to the main themes of the talk today. <clears throat> Okay, thanks. Um, so if, if, you're, if you want to come back to the discussion, we can talk about that later. But I think I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, issues related to that. Okay, so I'll let someone work out the counterexample that shows that near, near uh, optimum you might not be uh, convex. But for now, I'm going to move on. Okay, so I want to go faster than 1 over epsilon for a stochastic gradient style algorithm. Under standard assumptions, we think that this is, or we've proved that this is impossible, so we need stronger assumptions, because otherwise the lower bound will prevent this from happening. Um, okay, so we, we explored two possible stronger assumptions to get that faster rate. Uh, one of them is you assume you only have a finite training set, uh, and that might be sensible, because in many practical scenarios, you don't have infinite data, so maybe you can design an algorithm that exploits this. Uh, and then the second thing that you can think of doing is maybe you can just cheat by trying to find stronger assumptions where plain SGD would just go fast on its own. And so maybe those assumptions, if they're true, could explain practical success, or maybe if they're almost true, and they might also suggest new methods. And so I'm going to go over both of these approaches in the talk. So the first, many of you have probably seen me present a plot like this before. So if we look at the deterministic and stochastic methods and look at their bounds, here I've is, is someone yelling or is that random noise? I'm, I'm voting for yeah, random noise. noise. You can continue. OK. So we're plotting time or really number of gradients you calculate of individual functions. And we do the log of how far you are away from the optimum. And here we're just assuming we have a nice convex problem. So deterministic gradient descent, you evaluate the gradient on example 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to n. And then you do the same thing up to n. And after you, you do each n gradients, you take a step. But So you spend a lot of time doing nothing, but then you make steady progress. 
Whereas stochastic gradient, after every single random example, you take one step. And so you make a lot of progress, particularly on that first pass through the data. But then it slowly becomes more and more flat. And this is where the 1 over epsilon sort of shows up. Um, and again, at one of these summer schools, Joshua was like, well, Mark, let's do this thought experiment. Well, let's just make n grow. And if n grows, then this just gets longer and longer and longer. So there are data set sizes beyond which gradient descent is just not useful, and you must use stochastic gradient. Similarly, if, if you don't have much time, you need to use stochastic gradient. If you have lots of time, you should not use it. Uh, whereas if maybe this is your target accuracy, stochastic gradient is great. Whereas if, if this is your target accuracy, then you don't want to use stochastic gradient. Um, OK, so conclusion, gradient descent makes consistent progress with slow iterations. Stochastic gradient has fast iteration, but makes less and less progress over time. So you can design hybrid methods, things like initializing with SGD or increasing the batch size, whatever. Uh, but the methods I'm just going to briefly mention are the variance reduction methods, which can actually be even faster than the sort of default hybrids you would come up with. So that's things like SAG and SVRG. So these are, these are called variance reductions. They're all about using the fact that you have a finite training set. Uh, and they give you the cost of stochastic gradient with the progress of full gradient. So you have O of 1 iteration cost in terms of n. Uh, but they only need log of 1 over epsilon iterations, which makes us pretty, or at least much more happy as a computer scientist. The key idea of these is you build some sort of estimator of the gradient, and the, the variance of the estimator goes to the 0, even though the individual gradients might not be going to 0. So the first general method was with Francis Bach and with Nicola, uh, was with this SAG method. Key idea is you keep this memory of previous gradient values for each example. Um, th that works great for some problems. For other problems, that memory really hurts you. And so a year later, this method called SVRG was invented by a bunch of people. And I'm just showing the iteration here. So again, we have xk. We generate uh, an xk plus 1 using a step size alpha k. And here's our, um, our just grabbing a random gradient. And what you do is you subtract that same uh, the gradient of the same example at a different point plus the gradient of the full data set on that different point. And so those first few terms, that's regular SGD. And those last two terms, that's what's in Monte Carlo methods. It's called the control variant. Uh, and if you think about it, the expectation of this is equal to this. So the fact that these have different signs means that the, those things have a mean of 0, and we still have an unbiased gradient approximation. Usually, the reference point in a lot of the theories is updated something like O of n iterations. So you'll do something like n iterations of SGD. And then you'll compute this full gradient. And so it's really a mixture of like an SGD style step and computing full gradients. So variance reduction has led to faster methods in tons of settings. So here's, here's a plot of just comparing a bunch of different methods on conditional random fields. But it's been used all over the place for things like logistic regression and PCA and so on. So you see we have these stochastic methods that start out fast, but many of them slow down. Uh, you've got these deterministic methods that maybe start out slow, but then they eventually catch up and can pass the stochastic methods. Here's a hybrid method, if you like. Uh, and then SAG for this problem worked OK. For this problem, it worked a little bit better. And then that was just a slightly fancier version where you try and uh, visit the examples in a non-uniform way to make it a bit faster. All right, let me do one more slide, and then we can pause for any discussion points. Um, so variance reduction, that was that was eight years ago. 2012 was a long time ago. Many things have changed. Um, so it, it's gone in a ton of different directions over that time. So you can get rid of the memory in some settings for SAG. Um, there's variance giving faster algorithms for non-smooth problems. Uh, we know that there's variance that work for some non-convex problems. So that intuition that if it doesn't work for, uh, that if, if you work on convex problems, that can help with non-convex problems. That was true in some cases. So the big one is really problems like PCA. Um, there's also accelerated versions in the Nesterov sense. Uh, some people have shown that you can get better test error bounds, or at least you can improve the constants uh, in terms of test error compared to SGD. There's parallel and distributed versions. Uh, and as was mentioned at the start, uh, they, we got a medal for this. And it's, it's usually not uh, easy to get medals. And, and obviously, these things are, are somewhat political and, and arbitrary, but it, it, does, it doesn't say nothing that they get that we did get a kind of a neat award for this. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say on this slide is 
uh, doesn't really seem to help with deep learning. So many people have tried applying SPRG to neural networks and um, mostly with uh, saying it, it sort of doesn't change anything or maybe it even makes the performance worse. Um, so that's sort of the, the first approach which I'm done talking about, but maybe I'll pause here in case anyone wants to uh, make any comments or have questions or, or express enthusiasm or, or uh, commit threats or anything like that. So I have a question. Um, the When you say momentum-like variance, the first one that comes to mind is catalyst. And so I wanted to know if you had an intuition as to why momentum variants were so hard to come by. Um, I mean, it's because, you know, the folk knowledge is that momentum is more sensitive to noise than non-momentum version. Uh, I have yet to see a full proof of this. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you, if you had an intu intuition on that. So, so, if, so certainly if you try and analyze just an inexact gradient method, then, then as, as you know, we, we, we showed that under certain analyses, the, the accelerated method is more sensitive to noise. Uh, the other issue, which I'll show in a table later, is normally acceleration gets you from a, a kappa log 1 over epsilon to a O of uh, square root of kappa log 1 over epsilon, where kappa is the condition number. Um, for VR, you cannot uh, get the same improvement. You can't just replace the condition number with the square root of condition number. So I think the, the first few works were trying to do that, but it turns out it, it's actually not possible. We know that there's no, there's lower bounds. And so maybe uh, the first few works were maybe just being misled by trying to show something that it wasn't possible to show. Um, but I think nowadays there's tons of these accelerated methods and they all achieve basically the same bound, which, which I'll show later on in the talk. Okay, thanks. I didn't directly answer your question, but I threw out related facts. That's fine. Just to mention a past paper that shows it's more sensitive to noise. To me, we're still not sure if it's a failure of the analysis or of the method. Agree. Uh, I wouldn't take that as proof. Yeah, agree. Other thoughts? I think right. it's a cool picture, this, this medal. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations again to uh, Nicolas Leroux and Mark Schmidt and Francis Back. I think that was a, that was a, yeah. Yeah, it, it would have been an even cooler picture if Nicolas had come to get the medal. And if when they took the picture of me and Francis, we'd actually opened the thing and showed the medal. Instead, we, we just <laughs> didn't want to do it properly, but whatever. It was, it was still pretty neat. I think that was just taken yeah. on the table in the room afterwards. <laughs> It's the purple heart of science. Maybe. <laughs> Adam had a question, I think. Adam, did you have a question? Oh, just a very small question, which was, uh, what was the x-axis on those plots? Is it number of individual function iterations? That's right. So it's the number, it's the, it's the number of gradients you've calculated, which is almost time. Sure. That's what I thought. Thanks. OK, let me move on, because I think anyone else who ask, is asking a question is probably muted, and they'll need some time to figure that out. OK, so we wanted to, to go faster than this 1 over epsilon for SGD. And what we said we needed stronger assumptions. So we explored two ways to do this. One way is you assumed you only have a finite training set, and that led to some pretty neat methods. Uh, that was successful for, for like the majority of the problems in machine learning almost, but actually not for, for deep learning, which is really um, quite a bit bigger than it was uh, like 10 years ago. So let's talk about the second approach. Let's actually assume that, that SGD might be good already, and let's try and find stronger assumptions where SGD would go fast. And maybe that can explain why SGD works well for deep neural networks, and maybe it'll suggest new methods that have faster rates. So let's, a, let's ask this question. What conditions would we need for just plain old SGD to converge fast? And so there's this old condition, uh, which we renamed the strong growth condition, but it's not even ours. It was originally used by Tseng and Solodov, two very famous people independently explored this in the 90s to analyze SGD on neural networks. And so what are we doing here? We're assuming that um, if I look at this gradient approximation, and I look at its expected norm squared, that's less than or equal to some number rho, 
times the, the gradient of the overall function squared. So this is, this is the gradient of the expectation there. And so, okay. So what they showed in the 90s is if you have this condition or, or condition very similar to this, SGD will actually converge with a constant step size. So you don't actually need the decreasing step size to handle the variance, which is pretty nice. The reason this is true is if you think about this condition, it implies the variance goes to zero at a solution. So at a solution, we all know uh, if you're at like a you know first order stationary point, this thing's equal to zero. And then we've got a norm over here. So that means that this thing is also equal to zero, which means all of your unbiased gradient approximations are zero. So instead of having the step size go to zero to control the variance, the variance is sort of just going to zero on its own to control the variance. Now, if you're skeptical based on what I just said, you should be. This is an extremely strong assumption. I'm saying the gradient is zero at the solution for every single training example. So if the overall gradient is zero, every single training example also has a gradient of zero. Another way to think about this for many loss functions is the model is complicated enough to actually interpolate uh, the data. You can exactly fit the data. So let's just draw a picture of what this means at a solution. So in our usual assumption where we just say the, the variance is bounded, at a solution, if I'm plotting the individual gradients, they all basically have to point in different directions so they cancel out and add up to zero. So yeah, and then when you have the strong growth condition, well, at the solution, every single gradient is zero, so you have no variance. And so the, the local optima, even if they do look like convex functions, they look like kind of like different convex functions because they're all flat at the optimum. So yeah, if you have this condition, you don't need the step size to go to zero to counter the variance. That, that, that's really the key thing here. Okay, so uh, you can show that SGD with constant step size under this condition and under the usual assumptions only needs log of one over epsilon iteration. So if you have those assumptions, there's actually no need to use variance reduction. And it's even a bit stronger than that. You would be slowed down by using variance reduction because of some subtlety about which Lipschitz constant shows up in the convergence rate. So if those assumptions were true, Variance reduction is not only like not the solution, but it actually is, is you shouldn't uh, do it. So in 2013, uh, me and Nikola, we wrote a five page paper uh, in one day, we put it on archive. So here's the entire paper on the slide. If you zoom in just to emphasize that it's short, not too painful, a few references and so on. Uh, and then we really didn't think about it very much, or at least I'm maybe putting thoughts in Nikola's head, but, um, we were kind of thinking that this assumption doesn't really seem to be true for anything interesting. It seems kind of ridiculous, so let's not submit this for publication or anything like that. And and you know, even if it is true, you would probably overfit like crazy if this was true because it means your model is so complicated that you can you can sort of fit anything. Okay, so maybe I'll maybe I'll pause there to ask if there's any uh, discussion points or anything like that before I move on to the next part. When did you realize that maybe this assumption is not so ridiculous? How recently was it? Um, it was probably about 2015 or 16, but it was a while before I could convince a student to work on it. Um, but I'll get into that a bit more on the next the next like slide or two. Uh, I'll also mention that that me and Nicola and Simon, I think we're all office mates at this time. Good times. Yeah. Great influences. All right, let me keep going then. So something weird happened in 2014. There was this optimizer called Atom that came out. Uh, and it became ridiculously popular for training deep models. Um, but it sort of violated one of my fundamental assumptions, which is for some convex functions, this method has very poor performance. And so, I'm kind of like, what's going on here? If you don't work for convex functions, you shouldn't work for non-convex functions subject to someone uh, coming up with Simone's counterexample. Another thing that happened maybe like a year later is a bunch of groups published work showing that deep networks that, that are used in practice actually drive the error to zero. And so they've done these plots where you just make a network 
um, you make it wider and wider and you see that the training error just goes to zero, which of course, uh, that that's fine. We, we know that, that that's expected. But the more interesting part was that the test error did not go up like crazy. So we would normally expect the test error to go up like crazy. Uh, but for whatever reason, which which I'm not going to get into too much, but there's there's many talks and ideas about this, um, without excessively overfitting. So we have these models that can actually, because the, because the error is zero here, you're exactly fitting every data point, and you're not overfitting like crazy. And so that was kind of getting me to think about this old work again. Um, yeah, so, so maybe your interpolation isn't such a ridiculous assumption. Uh, then there was actually a paper that came out that sort of explored this. So, so I, I wish I would have convinced my students to work on it sooner, but this is a very nice paper. They basically show that SGD, if you just have interpolation, if you just assume that you fit every data point exactly, uh, that's sufficient to get the linear rate. And by, by linear rate, that's this O of log of 1 over epsilon for people that speak different languages just to have the translation. So they had some neat things in there, like they, they provided some justification and, and, and what the limits are of the linear scaling rule. They discussed the connection between interpolation and overparameterization. And so I'm just going to start using really overparameterization here. So I'm, I'm, when I say overparameterization, I mean you have so many parameters that the loss is actually going to go to zero. Um, so it turns out that's actually true for many modern deep neural networks. That was something I didn't realize, but it turns out to be true. Um, and it's also true, you know, if you just have a linear model with a sufficiently expressive basis, that also works. So if you just do linear regression, you keep adding columns, you can make it overparameterized. Um, and it's also kind of neat, you can actually make this true by making the model more complicated, which is not uh, a very complicated thing, but it's just something to keep in mind. So there's some weird thing that happens where if you keep adding more features, uh, you can start to make SGD go faster than if you have less features, which I think is very not intuitive and probably means we may need to like rewrite some things in our like numerical books uh, based on this. Because we normally think of the optimization problem getting higher as the dimension gets, or the optimization problem getting harder as the dimension gets higher. But this is saying that after a certain point, the optimization problem may be getting easier uh, in higher dimensions, or at some point in time, it gets easier. And a bunch of groups are also exploring implicit regularization of SGD, basically arguing that if you're, if you're using SGD, you may not ridiculously overfit even when you're using these ridiculously complicated models. OK, so um, around this time, I guess Sharon, who many of you know hey, Mark, and already on the call, I can't see. Yes, Simon. Uh, can I you think. just go back to the previous slide? Just to be clear, the, the line in green, that was already in your archive paper with Nicola, right? Um, SGD under interpolation as linear convergence rate. Uh, let me let me let me come to that on the next slide actually. So so technically we had something slightly stronger than interpolation, but but let me just I think that's the next slide. So let me just do that. So okay. okay. So hey, right. So right here. Um, actually, the assumptions used in that 2018 paper actually implied the assumptions in our 2013 paper. So uh, in, in some sense, yes, that was already in the 2013 paper, but um, we we didn't realize that. Um, that, that that connection was there, um, and this also made me really, really start to think that maybe the SGC is is uh, relevant in applications. Now, I'm I'm not saying that that paper showed it was true for neural networks. It's now been shown to be true for uh, the interpolation assumption has been shown to be true for some settings, um, but I I can't necessarily say that a given neural network necessarily satisfies this assumption. Okay, but in any case, let's just go with this. Let's say that this SGC and this interpolation explains something about the SGD behavior for deep learning. If that was true, if this was a good guide to explain the practical behavior, maybe that would explain why variance reduction doesn't help. Maybe it'd also explain why Adam and these constant step size things where he's a constant step size for the first X number of epochs and then he switched to a different constant step size. This would give some indication that those things are actually pretty reasonable things to do and that variance reduction is maybe not a good thing to do in these settings. Uh, if we go with this assumption too, it also suggests that may, there may be some opportunities for better deep learning algorithms. And so the next few slides, I'm just gonna show some recent works by, by, by Sharon and a bunch of my students and some students in, in Montreal as well as Simon of, of different things you can do if you make this assumption. Okay, so let's let's just talk about the a, ve a very simple thing you can do. So 
to work with Nicola, we assumed convexity, but in, in the intervening time, it tur turns out there's very simple ways to, to do simple analyses for non-convex functions. So, Sharon, so this is with uh, Sharon and Francis Bach. Uh, Sharon showed this result for non-convex functions. It looks a little bit weird because we're analyzing like the norm of the gradient. The reason you analyze the norm of the gradient is for non-convex functions, there's no guarantee you find the global optimum. So usually you just look at how fast you go to a stationary point. And we got this one over K dependency. And that's basically the same dependency you get if you do uh, full gradient descent. Uh, and, and this result, we didn't emphasize it too much, but I think it's actually pretty neat because it's, it's actually faster than all the previous non-convex results. So there's these, these fancy methods that try to get epsilon to the some fractional power to try and uh, get it smaller and smaller and smaller. This rate is actually faster than all those methods. Of course, it's under a stronger assumption. Uh, and you can argue that maybe this gives justification for things like using a constant step size or atom, which kind of behaves like a little bit like a constant step size if you look at it sideways. Um, and there was a related result um, by sort of the folks uh, that worked on the ICML paper. They analyzed under what's called the PL inequality, and they gave uh, much faster rates, but there's, the, the assumptions there are much stronger because there, if you have the PL inequality, then all minima are global minima. Whereas this rate is sort of handles general non-convex um, smooth functions. Okay, so maybe, maybe I'll maybe I'll pause there. That was our first result. This isn't a new algorithm. It's just arguing that SGD on non-convex problems under this assumption actually is a pretty reasonable thing to do. One question I have is: uh, you say Adam uh, was breaking under some. Uh, convex functions. And now you're saying perhaps because of strong growth condition, Adam is fine. So I, so I don't, why would Adam be fine then? Okay, so, so I'm gonna draw a little picture here. Uh, this is me and this is my hand and it's going like this, uh, it's waving. So I'm, I'm hand waving a little bit in making that statement. I, I don't have a rigorous uh, backup for what I just said. This is just my intuition. Well, do you have a, a bit more inf information about your intuition than just it's your intuition? Or? Uh, so so I, view, I, I view Adam because it's not really using like a decreasing sequence of steps. I think of this as sort of being approximately like a constant step size, or maybe it's constant step size plus preconditioner plus momentum. I see. Um, and in that setting, we, we, we would expect it to converge with uh, under the SGC. So, but, but it's really this thing we know about. This thing, there's, there's some question marks there still. Thanks. All right, so let me move on to, uh, to, to something closely related to that. So um, sort of a while ago, there was some papers arguing that nest drive acceleration for SGD might improve practical performance in some deep learning settings. Um, for those of you who don't know, Nesterov acceleration is pretty similar to momentum. The formulas are almost the same. Uh, and there's a lot of empirical evidence that momentum helps in many settings. So if you look at existing analyses of stochastic gradient or accelerated stochastic gradient methods, you don't really get the full acceleration, this sort of uh, improvement in the condition number that I mentioned earlier. So I apologize to people who haven't seen results like this before, but here's my table. So let's just do this one line at a time. Here's our regular gradient descent. And I'm looking at number of gradients you need to get within accuracy epsilon. And I'm using O tilde, so I don't have to do log of one over epsilon. So if I do regular gradient descent, you need kappa iterations, where kappa is the condition number, times n, because you need n gradients per iteration. And if you use nest of accelerated methods, you still need n gradients per iteration, but now you get square root of condition number. So you get sort of the full acceleration in that setting. If you do SGD with bounded variance, uh, then the normal rate is sigma squared. So this is the variance of the gradients divided by epsilon. So this is our one over epsilon rate. And then you get something like condition number divided by epsilon. And if you wanna be picky, there may be like a mu here or something like that, if you wanna be careful. Um, so the accelerate SGD methods, the first term is the same. They don't improve the dependence on the variance, but you gotta take the square root of this condition, this, uh, this second term. So it's actually faster if the condition number is bigger than the variance. 
Uh, and it also makes sense that if you're not close to the solution or if you're in a point where you're far enough from the solution that the condition number is much bigger than the variance, then you should see performance improvements from these accelerated methods, uh, as was seen in this paper. If we look at variance reduction, uh, you replace you have the normal rate is n plus kappa times log of one over epsilon. The n stays the same. You still have to look at every data point for these methods, but now you get square root of n times kappa. Uh, hey, and so that. Oh, sorry. Pardon? Hey, Mark. Yeah, can I, I have a question from Tim. Um, it's, what's the condition number for non quadratics? Is that is that Tim? Oh yeah, good question. <laughs> okay, so it's it's a little bit tricky. So. Um, um, if you're used to linear algebra condition number, um, so if I, have a, if I have a least squares problem, let's say, ax minus b squared, uh, the Hessian would be my usual a transpose a, and your condition number would be condition number of a transpose a. So if you're used to looking at linear systems and you're saying, why don't I have condition number squared and condition number, it's because... Uh, the way the condition number is defined for an optimization problem is a little bit differently. Uh, now, for, for a general optimization problem, uh, kappa, we define basically a lower bound on the Hessian that has to hold everywhere. And we defined an upper bound. Apologize for my awful writing. And then the condition number is, is uh, m over m. And so it, it generalizes this least squares case and generalizes the linear algebra usual condition number other than this using square roots instead of uh, linear and then the linear instead of square. But that assumes L smooth and strong, like that's strong convexity, right? right? Yes, absolutely. So all, all of these results on this slide, we're now in the convex and we're out now in the strongly convex world and, and it's continuous. And in, for this particular result, we also have the, the variance problem. <clears throat> OK, thanks. OK, so, so coming back to where I was, I was just mentioning the VR methods. So you might hope that you can get a, a square root of kappa here. It turns out you can't do that. You can only get a square root of n times kappa. So this is faster if kappa is greater than n. Otherwise, it's the same. So again, for ill-conditioned problems, there's a chance that variance reduction methods can be accelerated. But if you're not ill-conditioned, at least in terms of the bound, you can't really gain by using acceleration. Uh, and then uh, the result that, that really these folks showed, I, most, I, I would say my contribution was just saying it's, it's a cool problem to look at and helping with the writing, is that in the SGC setting, you can get, you can get uh, O of kappa from our 2013 paper. And then the 2019 paper in AI stats showed you can get uh, the square root of kappa. So you can get the unconditional acceleration, which I think is, is kind of neat. Um, okay. What do you call this SGC plus SGC? <laughs> let's let's sneak a let's sneak a D in there. Oh, okay. I thought you had two. You needed two conditions. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, for the second order, we'll need two conditions. But for the first order, yeah, it's just the uh, same assumptions as the 2013 paper. Um, so yeah, this is this is for convex, as I mentioned above. Uh, you need to set the parameters properly, otherwise it, it's not true. Uh, and other people showed some special cases of this result too. So other people were thinking about uh, similar things at the same time. Okay, so that, that's the, that's the, a, a faster SGD, so it's, it's nice. It beats the lower bound. You don't need the finite data assumption, so kind of neat. All right, so now the moment I'm sort of most excited about, which now has uh, many more co-authors. So we've got Sharon, we've got Simo, we've got Gautier, Assam, who I think all, everyone is in Montreal now except for me, uh, and Aaron, who I guess is going to Stanford in the fall. Sorry, Simo. Uh, okay, so the previous results, all of those results I've mentioned, they basically said you need to have a particular step size, you need to know the smoothness constant. Uh, so we don't really want results that depend on eigenvalues of the Hessian. Uh, so we want a way to set this. So yeah, if you if you don't, what am I saying here? Existing methods to set step size don't guarantee fast convergence. I see. So if you do things like coin betting and, and Adagrad and the online learning things and probabilistic line searches and no more pesky learning rates, all that stuff. None of those sort of guarantee this log of one over epsilon rate as you would expect. Uh, and so these folks uh, showed that, that you can set the step size as you go and achieve this rate. And they, they achieved 
not quite optimal, but pretty close to optimal rates in a variety of settings. So strongly convex, convex, non-convex, you don't have to read them, but I'll just summarize that you basically get the same rate as if you had like the best uh, constant step size. Uh, so it's pretty nice. And then there's the potential to go a lot faster because the line search might just happen to pick a much bigger step size than the worst case on every step. And then you might converge much faster. Do you, how do you do a mirror backtracking if you don't have a descent direction? Yeah, great question. So let me let me show you the, uh, the algorithm. Um, it's just a very simple modification. Uh, all you do is you do the backtracking on the mini batch. Okay. So instead of doing it on the function, which is too expensive, you do backtracking on the individual example you sample, or if you have a mini batch, you do it on the mini batch. Um, so yeah, backtrack if you don't improve cost on the batch relative to the norm of the batch's gradient. So this isn't even our algorithm. This was actually in those 90s papers on the SGC. Uh, they were saying that if you do our MEO backtracking under that condition that you get conversions, or at least they were saying very similar, something similar to that. But I think this over-parameterized view provides new insight as to why this is actually uh, explaining what's, or might be explaining some of the stuff that's happening in practice. Um, so intuitively, the, you're doing this backtracking step where occasionally you divide the step size if it's too big, so your step sizes don't get big. You have to be a little bit careful at how you initialize the step size because you don't want to spend tons and tons of uh, iterations backtracking. But if you if you initialize it properly, uh, you you basically guarantee that it's not too small. And then the theory says that if you're careful with this, you're as good as the best constant step size. Uh, in terms of cost, this is more expensive, so you need at least an extra forward pass per iteration because now you need to compute uh, the function at the new value. So this and this you get out of back prop, but you'll need to do an extra forward prop to get the extra gradient. And then for each each time you backtrack, you also have to do a forward pass. And so we propose just a heuristic to set this initial step size and to do the backtracking. And in practice, the median number of backtracking steps per duration was zero. So that's nice. So the median cost is 1.5 times the cost of the normal um, SGD method. but uh, I think that's slightly misleading because if you compare it to running SGD with like 10 different step sizes, then it's a real big gain in computation if you just have to run it with one step size or one step size procedure. Um, I have one more slide on this and then I'll pause again. So yeah, there have been a ton of experiments done on this. Um, so mainly focusing on CNNs on, on standard problems. Uh, we've compared to a lot of different things. I kept bugging the students to compare to more and more things because it, it, it does well, and so it's good to just emphasize it. So we found that it's better than using fixed step size, a lot of adaptive methods, or like uh, Adagrad and Atom and so on, which are probably somewhere on here. Uh, and then like adaptive step sizes, things like coin betting and so on. So we've really found that it's working a lot better. And this is no fancy um, scaling of each dimension or anything like that. This is just basic SGD with a, with a better step size. Um, and those are some of the results. So maybe I'll pause there to ask if there's any uh, questions or comments or points to discussion. And I'll also emphasize that I think um, this painless SGD is probably the most um, interesting thing on, on this, where we just took an algorithm that already existed, but just showed that for modern problems, it may actually work pretty well. Are these results, or these graphs here, are they uh, test or training errors? Uh, good question. So the, these are tests, but there are also training errors in the, in the paper. And I think that they show similar results. Thanks. Yeah, that we really um, want to do tests because obviously the implicit regularization is important in this over-parameterization setting. We didn't want to lose that. Uh, Nico? Uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so usually when uh, you present the test set, usually people argue that if you run the other algorithm a bit longer, then they achieve a better test error. Uh, what happens if you run just more iteration waiting for the convergence of all the algorithm? What is the one that achieve the best test error? Yeah, I have no idea, but I'm, I'm going to ask that question to the people that are doing the experiments. So what happens if you run longer? Uh, not, not completely sure, to be honest. OK, thank you. And do you know uh, where does it fail? Uh, I think I've got that on the next slide. Some, some. So I've, I've sort of, I've given you the good stuff, and now I'm going to give you the bad stuff on the next slide. I think, and, and you feel free to ask that question again if you're not happy with my 
Next slide. Can Actually, I, can maybe I ask about the SGC? Is yes, it, how, do you verify the SGC in some way, or you're just assuming it holds, or or what? Okay, so uh, actually, let me let me do the the next slide, and then we can come back to both those questions if you want to come back to them. Okay, so so first, some like uh, to ease some maybe some of the anx anxiety and skepticism. Uh, you don't need to run it to the point of interpolating the data. It just theoretically needs to be possible. So if you want to stop it early, then that's great. Uh, and related to that uh, is we didn't do this in the paper, but but most of these results can be modified where if, if it's only close to interpolation, you'll basically get an extra term depending on your step size and how close you are. So you would get the results that we showed plus an extra term depending on how close you are to interpolation. And so that's something that it's it's fairly straightforward to do for most of these results. So it doesn't really exactly need to be satisfied. Uh, and so, for example, there were some synthetic experiments that were ran where we sort of controlled how overparameterized you are. So if you're overparameterized, it works great. If you're close, it still actually worked really well. So even though the assumptions were violated, it was OK. And it was far from being overparameterized. Over it just doesn't work at all. Because you're doing these Armia line searches on random directions, and they're taking you to crazy places. And so that, that's not good. Um, I should also mention that a few days after we put our paper on archive, another another group proposed a similar method. Um, we've compared to a whole bunch of different ways to set the step size. This seems to work um, in practice. Um, now, to, to add some, some things, one thing I learned after the paper was submitted is all the experiments were done with batch normalization. And I was like super shocked to hear this because like that definitely does not put it closer to the theory at all. Um, but lately, they've said they've redone all the experiments without that, and they said that the trends were similar. Um, on the other hand, for LSTMs, um, it did not work out of the box. So they found the step sizes got way too small. The convergence wasn't good. Uh, so they, the students say that they've got something working for LSTMs now, but the, the thing I've presented today is it did not seem to be good enough to work on LSTMs, um, even when the overparameterized assumptions seem to be satisfied. Um, and some of those results have some assumptions that if you think about them carefully, they're maybe a little bit stronger than you would like. So if, if you want to do theory in this area, certainly relaxing the assumptions we have, particularly for the non-convex cases, is sort of an interesting theoretical challenge if you want to go down that route. OK, and now I'll let you, if you want to come back to your questions or ask other questions, maybe, maybe I'll pause here uh, after these discussion points. Well, I have a question, Mark. Yep. Uh, what was the importance of momentum here? Are you using momentum? Not at all. Did it make a difference? Ah, uh, yeah. So in this, in the painless paper, uh, there was no momentum in the theory. Uh, in principle, you it may be possible to add momentum and combine that with the line search. I believe that uh, these two, at least, and possibly Assam two, are working on that now. Um, in this paper, there were experiments with momentum and with uh, Nesterov acceleration, but we didn't find that it worked better. So I'm just going to go back to the previous slide, and I think I can point that out on the plot. So that I believe was this one uh, had just had momentum and it's blue and it's okay, but it wasn't as good as the method without momentum. I believe this is because you need to like here, we're just focusing on the alpha parameter, but in momentum, you have the beta parameter. I think setting beta has to be done differently if you, if you're doing a line search. Uh, and this is just from intuition in the deterministic case where I found the, the deterministic case, case, the methods that set alpha and beta tend to work much better than the methods that just set alpha uh, in my like empirical uh, experience. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, actually, uh, the beta needs to be also varying according to the size is uh, what I think is the correct thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, I think you, you, you uh, it's not like the deterministic case where you can decouple them if you want good performance, anyways. Yeah, and the standard uh, settings of the momentum parameter didn't work. So, like for example, setting it to 0.9 just diverges. So, yeah, we had issues with these things when we were doing these experiments. And do you have a heuristic to set the 
the momentum parameter? Oh, for these experiments, we actually did a grid search. It was awful. <laughs> Thanks. Wait, the grid search still didn't work? 0.5 came out to be the best one. But uh, if you go, if you increase it in the beginning, it's fast, but then it just spirals out of control. So there okay. is like some trade off. Yeah, I, I think the beta is going to need to be changed over time. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Yes, at, at the moment we're working on this uh, together with line search and polyax step sizes to find okay. the correct momentum. And I it turns out that the momentum should also uh, modify like the line search or polyax step sizes in order to guarantee conversions. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, you, you may also want to look up SSO. It's a neat algorithm if you've never heard of it. So this is a sequential subspace optimization by Zibu Levski. Uh, it's pretty neat. It's like a different way to do Nesterov acceleration if you can do um, two-dimensional line searches. Uh, it, it's, it's much faster in practice, but it requires 2D line searches, which you can only do for certain problems. Um, okay, so let me do the last one. So this is again uh, some some Mila folks, Sharon, Issam, and Simo, and then my master student Kathy, who I guess is going to Cornell. I think is the final decision. Um, okay, so let's go, let's go back to this idea of stochastic Newton. So on one of the very first slides, I said stochastic Newton can't help because of the variance, uh, but now SGC is going to get rid of the variance. So let's go back and think about stochastic Newton again. And so these folks have done some pretty neat things. Um, if you do stochastic Newton and use a constant batch size, you get linear convergence. That's sort of what you would expect, but now you don't need a finite sum assumption or you don't need an exponentially growing batch size. Those would be the normal ways you would get linear convergence under um, for, a, I guess, a, a linear, uh, just a gradient style method. Uh, and then you get like a local quadratic style convergence if you actually use the exponentially growing batch size. And this is faster than methods that um, just uh, didn't have the SGC. So they actually needed faster than exponential growth of the batch size for superlinear convergence. So that's, that's kind of a, a nice result. Um, that paper, I'm not going to cover it very carefully. There are, you do need some extra assumptions there. Uh, and in the paper, they, they did a whole bunch of neat things like analysis for self-concordant functions. Unfortunately, you don't get the affine invariant result that you would like, but you do get some result. They looked at like quasi-Newton style things and like Hessian free implementations so that you don't have a quadratic uh, cost or anything like that. And you can definitely do Hessian free for neural networks. All right, so let me wrap up because I don't want to go too far over time. So, so let's just think of some take home messages. So if you're using under-parameterized models, then things like uh, SVRG and so on, they make sense. You should still use variance reduction. For over-parameterized models, it probably doesn't make sense to use variance reduction. So we talked about some things, uh, how optimization works in, in this over-parameterized setting. So we said that SGD, just plain SGD, is actually fast under these things. You don't need variance reduction, and it might slow you down. You can go faster with acceleration. You can maybe make it painless with the line search. Uh, and then furious if you use second order information. Um, I told my students to come up with a more exciting title and, and I guess I got what I deserved. Um, I would say try out the line search. Um, I think Islam has code online and we want to sort of find the failure cases. So um, the goal is really to have a black box code that just works out of the box so you don't have to worry about optimization. Uh, and then the last thing I'll mention is coming back to maybe the approach one for getting faster rates is variance reduction might still be relevant for deep learning because Simol and friends uh, showed that for GAN training, maybe variance reduction still has a place. OK, so I will end there. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for taking the time to listen to the talk and listen to, to me hand wave and maybe say some things that are less hand wavy. I, I hope you got something out of it. Thanks.